Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Joseph Attic, Executive Chairman of ID for Africa, and I'd like to welcome you to our 20th livecast. This episode comes on the heels of our season three kickoff, where two weeks ago, we've commemorated International Identity Day and introduced a new exciting segment we call Eye on Africa. But before we start today's episode, I'd like to reflect briefly on what had actually happened on September 16. By any measure, this year was exceptional. We witnessed a groundswell of support for the recognition of September 16 as Identity Day. The day was celebrated by the identity stakeholders in dozens of African countries to sensitize their populations to the importance of having proof of identity. It was refreshing to see the day observed across the continent with such enthusiasm and initiative, even though this is not yet officially recognized as a World Day by the United Nations. What we saw was a grassroots action in Africa that demonstrated that the continent is not waiting for the UN General Assembly to recognize the day. Many countries are taking matters into their own hands and have commemorated it because more than any other place on earth, identity matters in Africa. Take a look at the following one minute video, which captures only a glimpse of what took place. Operator, please launch the video. In the chat, you will find the link to ID Day page, which has more images and videos from what took place on that extraordinary day. When you see such footage, you realize this is very real. Our grassroots movement is building awareness and accelerating the march towards responsible identity for all in Africa. You cannot make such footage up. The intensity, the breadth, and the initiatives of the events in Africa were exciting to see. But when we look at the rest of the world, we realize there is still a lot of work for us to do to explain the significance of this day to the world outside Africa. No developed country observed or officially noticed it, even though some mainstream international media has begun picking up on our message of identity being an existentialist right. It is clear that the advocacy for identity remains entrenched within the development agenda. This is to be expected given the priorities and needs of developing countries. And it is also the consequence of our past singular focus on ID for D. But now as identity goes digital and its use permeates across the globe, accelerated by the recovery in the COVID aftermath, we have an opportunity to broaden our narrative to highlight the fact that this existentialist right should not be taken for granted by people in developed countries. Identity is precious, but it's also vulnerable. It can be usurped or abused in many ways. This is especially true in countries where the rush towards the digitization of the human experience and the resulting abundance of aggregated data have created risks to privacy and individual liberties. We believe our advocacy for the protection of identity and privacy are as important as our drive for identity for all. The convergence of the two missions should sustain us forward and September 16 as International Identity Day is a perfect tool for broadening our reach globally. We're painfully aware that in order to succeed in getting September 16 recognized as World ID Day at the UN, we will need to mobilize the developed nations as well. 
While September 16 this year is still fresh in our minds, it behooves us to begin our outreach worldwide, keeping the duality of our stated mission in mind. Advocate identity for all, for those who do not have it, and advocate the protection of it for those who do. This makes our campaign richer, albeit more challenging, but it also gives us universal appeal. We hope that we can call on our worldwide network of partners to join us. If you believe you are in a position to influence your country's leadership in this regard, please reach out to us. Our new expanded Friends of the Coalition category should allow us to welcome anyone who thinks will be able to contribute to the objective of establishing September 16 as World Identity Day. Please check out the link in the chat for more information. Before we move on, we're curious to find out how you observe the day. So we have a quick yes, no poll for you. Operator, please launch the poll. Okay, so the first question, this is a two question poll. Did you see anything about Identity Day on September 16? So if you've seen it on social media, if you've seen it through emails that were sent to you, if you've seen it uh, on radio, on television, on the street, anything. Please vote uh, honestly, because we just want to know to what extent um, there has been um, awareness. Okay, um, operator, I think we can end the poll, for, we can end this one. So we're talking about 70% uh, said yes, we've seen it, 30% said no, we have not seen it. Okay, that's not bad, that's not bad. Uh, ask the second question, please. Now we're saying, it's not seen it. Did you do something to celebrate ID Day? Meaning, have you sent somebody um, a message saying happy thanks, the happy identity day, or you tweeted or did something? It's okay if you haven't. Just we want to be aware uh, so we can mobilize next year better. Okay. Okay. Operator, you can end the poll. So basically 60% roughly said, no, I didn't do anything for Identity Day and 40% said yes. So no problem. I think uh, next year we have opportunity to all participate and continue this sensitization campaign. Okay, back to today's episode. The episode will consist of two segments as advertised. Let's put up the, the two segments. Uh, the first will be a new policy segment we call To The Point. Uh, today, I will talk to Liv Nordog, who is the co-lead of the Digital Public Goods Alliance and a project manager at the Norwegian development agency, NORAD. We will discuss strategic decisions for building government digital platforms that achieve sovereignty and maintain fitness for purpose throughout the lifetime of national projects. This will be a 15, 20 minute segment, depending on your questions and community voices. We will then start our second segment, which consists of two parts. Part one will be South Africa report, where we have with us Luvhiwani Makode, the DG of Home Affairs South Africa. And in part two, we'll have the Kenya report with Ruben Kimoto, the Director of National Registration Bureau, and Janet Musheru, the Director of Civil Registration from Kenya. These promise to be very informative sessions that show how attention to homegrown solutions and local capacity building can lead to sovereignty and empowerment. I know many of you are looking forward to hearing from these two countries as they have been making significant progress but have not been seen on the speaker circuit. So we are pleased to give you the opportunity to hear from them first here on today's episode. Before we start, I have a few quick housekeeping items to share. First, I'd like to share, thank our development partners, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, for their support of our live guests. Their presence with us is keeping this community strong and well informed. Also, I'd like to unveil the lineup for the next live guest, which is on October 13. We will have a to the point segment with Tariq Malik, who has recently rejoined Pakistan's NADRA, the National Database and Registration Authority, as its new chairman, and has been moving his country's identity ecosystem into the next generation and into the future. Lots of useful lessons and insights to share. We will also hear from the, the Morocco and Lesotho reports 
two countries who have been innovating in building their national population registers as basis for service delivery, including in the case of Morocco, a large scale deployment of the open source platform MOSIP. So we hope you will mark your calendar and will join us for this must see live guest. The link to register for this event has just been released in the chat. Also this morning, we opened up a call for participation to a very special thematic live cast we are planning to hold on November 17. The topic is the dark side of identity, mitigating the risks. This is really the opportunity for us to explore in which ways identity systems could be harmful if not implemented correctly. We will examine themes such as entrenchment of exclusion, discrimination, gender and racial bias, and invasion of privacy and data exploitation. We believe the full spectrum of such dangers can be mitigated and the benefits of identity systems for individual empowerment overweigh the risks when formulated within a well-defined legal frameworks and protection guardrails. If you believe you can contribute to this important discussion, we invite you to submit an expression of interest to join the panel as soon as possible. The link is in the chat. This will be a panel of experts, practitioners, and civil society drawn from the global community of stakeholders. So be there. Finally, we are less than 24 hours away from the deadline, closing deadline, for voting for this year's Good Idea Awards. As I had mentioned last time, ID for Africa was nominated under the inclusion category. If you find us deserving, please vote for us. This is your last chance to show the world that your movement is making a difference in the fight for inclusion. If you have voted, we thank you. If you have not, here, is, here in the link is here's the link in the chat and you can vote right now. Thank you to everyone. While you're voting, I'd like to remind you that you can participate in today's discussion through several ways. Uh, you can do it via the chat, so meet your colleagues and, and network. You can also participate as you've done through the live polling, but also the question and answer. If you want to ask questions, please put them into the Q&A section. And then of course, community voices, which I highly encourage you to participate. We, we have several opportunities today to bring you on the stage. Uh, before we move on, I'd like to welcome the new members of our community and ask you to, to please subscribe to our YouTube channel, ID for Africa Media. And if you watch this episode in replay and you enjoyed it, please like it. Your votes tell YouTube that this is an episode worth proposing to other viewers outside our community. So that little click of the YouTube like button can be an important step in our going beyond the core campaign. Thank you for remembering. Subscribe, watch, enjoy, and like. We're now ready to kick off our program with To The Point. To The Point is a segment that we intend to bring from time to time to our live guests. It is dedicated to sharing with you cutting edge policy, business and pro process reengineering, as well as tech innovations in an executive summary. It will be in a one-to-one -one type format where I engage with a thought leader or a personality from the identity community. Today, we're very pleased to kick off this brand new segment with Liv Nordhog. So join me in welcoming Liv. I understand Liv is joining us from the UN General Assembly session, which is supposed to be back to back with our session. So, but I see that uh, Liv has arrived. So. Thank you so much. Yes, I have arrived. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Welcome. Welcome um, to this session. Actually, to start this, um, explain to the, to the audience the two hats that you wear so we can uh, establish <laughs> your credentials. <laughs> yes, so, so uh, well, um, I co-lead the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, and uh, this alliance, the secretariat for that is co-hosted by the government of Norway and UNICEF. So I guess my other hat is that I'm located in the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation, NORAD, uh, as a co-lead. So uh, I'm based in Norway in the Norwegian Agency for Development Cooperation. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. Welcome, welcome. So today we'll focus mostly on one hat that you're wearing, which has to do with the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Now, um, what's the objective of the Digital Public Goods Alliance? Um, I, I think it can be said quite simply as the main aim is to accelerate um, uh, really the Sustainable Development Goal Agenda with a particular focus on, on supporting uh, low and middle income countries. 
Um, and uh, and uh, we do believe that digital public goods can really be a kind of um, node uh, of an ecosystem that can help us shift how we think about international development assistance and the digital development in general. Okay. So um, that's that's the presumption. Okay, we are going to sort of delve deeper into the topic, but let's let's take it step by step. One of the um, the things that we've been hearing a lot about lately has been the so-called Gulf step. Many many countries, many governments are sort of consolidating a lot of their IT developments uh, and many of the of sectorial sectoral developments into Gulf stacks. So so where does the Gulf stack fit, and and how should we think of it? Yes. No. So I can um, I can uh, speak to that from from how we have approached it. Uh, so when we think about um, there, there are many concepts used. So so and digital public goods can um, are open source technologies that are relevant for for um, uh, the sustainable development goals. But you can think of a particular subset of of digital public goods that are those that can be deployed by countries as part of their digital public infrastructures. Um, so uh, and and if you think of these digital public infrastructures, you can envisage those as having several layers, or, and layers can be combined into a stack. Uh, and, and the layers that are most frequently mentioned are indeed digital identity, often in combination with, uh, with the civil registration and verification systems as a complement. Uh, and then there are digital payment solutions and data exchange systems. Those are very frequently mentioned as part of a gov stack. Uh, and I do believe that uh, the concept, uh, at least it's very frequently used uh, in, relate, in relation to India. Uh, but I think more and more countries are taking this stack approach because uh, the, these types of technologies are seen as very, um, together they can enable a large set of sector use cases and really help uh, accelerate attainment of, uh, of uh, goals across multiple sectors. So that's, that's my take. Uh, and we have also approached this more and more in the Digital Public Goods Alliance as a priority. Us. So it's it's fair to say that this is sort of a foundational infrastructure that's shared by many sectors that the government could put in place and could accelerate uh, and could could help avoid redundant developments by different sectors. Yes, that's that's correct. And I would also like to mention that there is actually something called the GovStack Initiative. Uh, that is, uh, um, we are seeing more and more the synergies with the Digital Public Goods Alliance. Uh, this has been um, uh, started by um, Estonia, Germany, uh, ITU, and Dial, mm -hmm. uh, and it has the same uh, basis. And uh, Germany has now joined the Digital Public Goods Alliance, so we are really aligning with that initiative, also. Okay. Okay, so obviously, whether you call it GovStack or you call it sort of a foundational infrastructure for public infrastructure, um, what do you think are the important design principles um, that governments should be paying attention to when they put such a, an important and foundational, uh, obviously, this is not something you want to be doing every year, you want to be building for the future, so, right? So, yes. No, I think, you know, as with all foundations, they should be something you can build on long term. Um, but I think in the digital world, maybe more than in the physical world, you really need and you have the opportunity to be able to evolve your foundations also uh, to respond to, uh, to new needs. Um, but then there are some principles you must take into account to ensure that and that is, of course, interoperability between the different layers of a stack, for instance, uh, and, and making sure that, that you have that as a government, that you have that strategic um, opportunity or that sovereignty, as, as I called it when I entered, um, to, uh, to, to do that. Uh, so that brings me to the issue of vendor lock-in, for instance, which I also, I'm aware that uh, it is an issue that uh, has also been highlighted by ID for Africa. I came across the survey you did in 2018, for instance, where vendor lock-in was ranked as one of the uh, key right. concerns as the key concern by by African uh, the African identity community, and I do think it is tremendously important to avoid being locked in to something where that prevents you from making that evolution to meet also future needs. 
Um, and then, of course, inclusion uh, and, and, you know, best practices that are well embedded, I think, in the sustainable uh, um, uh, principles for sustainable identification, for instance, um, that you should make sure that your uh, foundations serve everyone and that they include everyone and leave no one behind uh, and that they are safe and that they are trusted. Those, I would say, are some key guiding principles. Okay, so let's let's uh, uh, take a look at at the sovereignty. Um, it is it is a concept that is not um, really explored extensively. I mean, we hear about it, but it it feels like good hygiene. But I think what we need to talk about is sort of how do we achieve high sovereignty? I mean, I I am trying to build systems, and what's the flip side of the coin? What do I pay in order to get sovereignty? Yeah, so. You know, uh, when we talk about digital public goods, it's really about uh, being able to adopt and adapt. And I'm going to be a bit sneaky, Joseph, because I, as you mentioned, I, I am coming just from uh, a UN General Assembly high level call where I had um, the opportunity to uh, to uh, speak between uh, UNICEF uh, Executive Director Henrietta Four and also UNDP's uh, Administrator Akim Steiner. And I will actually reuse a couple of my points from there because that is indeed what uh, digital public goods are about as well. Because I did make a point there about sovereignty. And what I did say is that we are also seeing this, this is not only a low and middle income country phenomenon. And I think it's very important to emphasize. So I did quote, for instance, the um, uh, Digitalization Agency of Norway uh, and I do, I do want to read out that particular quote, if you will allow me, for, please, for this audience very quickly. Please, please, please. When you build a digital solution on top of proprietary software, you have in practice lost the control of your own future. For instance, if the vendor chooses to phase out the product. So that is one statement. Uh, and then it says, if you had used open source software as your base, you would in the same situation have been able to make a fork or someone else could have made one that you could continue using. So that's... I think that highlights something. And also uh, the UK government is really stressing that government officials should be looking to open source first. They should mm -hmm. consider that first before they go proprietary. So the point I made in, in, in where I just came from is that we're always talking about, uh, you know, about practicing what we preach. But I also think it's important for the international development community to actually start to preach what we are practicing. Right. Because high, the, the world is, I think many countries are reaching the same conclusion at the same time. So I think, uh, I do want to challenge that we haven't thought a lot about the uh, digital sovereignty because I think many yeah. countries are now embedding this as core part of their government policies. So I think we need to make sure at least that uh, in an international development scene, we are not advocating the way we did things 10 years ago, for instance, in Norway, we have to talk about what we're doing today. So I think that's a very important point that uh, that should be uh, that everyone should be challenged on. But would you would you go as far as saying that sovereignty implies open source? I think sovereignty at least implies that if, if you are going to buy proprietary, you have to be very, very good at procuring and specifications. Mm -hmm. You have to be very good at anticipating your future needs and you have to be extremely tough at negotiating the right contracts. But, so, but, yes. we, know, but we know in reality, nobody has the vision of what our future requires and needs. And so it's a, virtually impossible to actually build a specification for something that's going to last 10 years in, in, in the way technology is, is changing. So practically speaking, the only way I could do this is I could if I could do it myself. In a way, you are you are answering your own question. <laughs> so yes. Right. You, I mean, you, you're, you're leading me down that path because you're leaving yes. me no option. <laughs> yeah, but what I want to say though is that this is not, um, it's not a quick fix, it's not a silver bullet, because it can, first of all, open source can also go very wrong in the sense that uh, you do need expertise and capacity to implement uh, open source and to adopt uh, and adapt to, to local needs. Um, and, and this capacity really needs to, it takes time to build up. Uh, and uh, there are many issues that need to take, be taken into account, but particularly, and I want to stress that, Today, we're particularly talking about digital public infrastructure. We're 
talking right. about the foundations. I don't think it is necessarily equally important higher up in the way in the chain, right. but now we're talking about the, the foundations that you build the rest of your house on. Right, but what about, I mean, the risk? Typically what, what I hear in talking to government officials, they basically say, yes, sovereignty is a wonderful thing, but my, my problem is I need immediacy. I need to be able to build this infrastructure now. And my, feel, my fear is if I'm doing it myself, I don't have the capacity. And as a consequence, I risk failure. So how do we address that issue? Well, I think, I think this is a challenge and, and you mentioned my two hats. So if we, if we challenge the international development uh, agencies and, and the, the stakeholders in that system, I think we have to be very mindful of um, promoting this capacity building. And it really should have started, not yeah. even yesterday, it should have started many years ago. Uh, I do think it's happening uh, in, in, uh, in many instances now, but I do think we have to pay a lot of attention to it. But I do think um, I do think one great opportunity that comes with open source that can help address part of that concern is the opportunity to actually build capacity while implementing. Mm -hmm. um, so because there is this opportunity for agency or for, and for building capacity and trust through agency, because uh, the technology allows you to do that. So that's one point. But we need to have systems in place that support that. And that could be, you know, uh, academic uh, scholarship structures. It could be ways of being able to do paid implementation research while also being part of, of your country's implementation journey. You have great examples for this, for instance, in health with something called the DHIS2 and the Health Information Systems Program, uh, which has done that. And uh, and um, so so I, I think that is that is at least one um, good opportunity. And of course, there is also, um, there's a huge role to play for commercial vendors also in an open source uh, mm -hmm. ecosystem or a system where the code itself is open. And that is for integration services. Right. So, um, you know, you can have models that are very uh, closely centrally government managed, or you can have models at least where a lot of the, the actual implementation is outsourced. Um, but you still retain the opportunity to evolve the software. Uh, and that is the great part. So you can do a lot of the same things and procure services that you need. And I think the, the World Bank and the UN and the whole multilateral system is tremendously important in supporting countries to do that right. And I do want to commend, for instance, uh, ID4D and G2PX and the World Bank for doing excellent work on country technical assistance also for countries that are increasingly looking to adopt uh, open source, like most for instance. Mm -hmm. But actually, th th there is a dimension which is capacity is, is not capacity building needs to be sustainable and long term and needs to be deep in the sense that you have a bench which you continually populate with talent, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The, the fear that I have is that I don't see in the development agenda, development priorities, I don't see grants that are given to governments that say, we are going to be giving you hundreds of thousands of dollars available for training 20, 30 people in your staff. Um, do you think that's going to change? Do you think the development agenda is going to evolve to allow for that? That's what's needed. Well, I can at least promise you, Joseph, that this is indeed one of the areas that I am really, through the Digital Public Goods Alliance, working to try to change and to leverage. And, and I do see increasing willingness uh, to, to uh, um, do more funding for capacity building. So yes, I think I will be confident enough to say that I think change is coming. Uh, I think COVID-19 is actually helping accelerate that change uh, because of the increasing demand for uh, for improving social safety nets and and being able to uh, for governments to pay, for instance, out um, subsidies and and uh, support to vulnerable populations. So so yes, but it's it's not coming. Uh, we 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 have to work hard to make that change. But I think it's something that is about to happen. Yes. Excellent. So we have a lot more to come with you. Uh, let me just pause one second and see anybody in the community voices would like to join the panel with me and Dev. 
please raise your hand we'll bring you on. In the meantime, um, there's another element that I think uh, creates a significant concern, which is when we do capacity building, there's a fear of brain drain. What happens is you basically train these people and they get picked up by industry and, and they're able to benefit from that training. So, so how do we address that issue? Yeah, no, and and uh, I, I'm happy I got that question, and I will. I do want to revisit uh, the the example I touched upon earlier. So I do really believe that there can be something uh, in in collaboration with academia here, um, mm -hmm. because and and I have experience working on human resource development in the public sector uh, in a different sector uh, back in the days in in Timor Leste, where where I experienced this and saw this very closely. Um, I do think that. A combination of having, um, for instance, the opportunity to have scholarships that uh, that can uh, allow uh, government staff, for instance, to do a PhD, a postdoc, uh, assuming, of course, that you have qualified staff in this st at the starting point. That can be a way where you could potentially be involved in implementation research and actually in Im implementing the systems in your own country, mm -hmm. while. Living, uh, earning um, also uh, a salary that makes it uh, that makes it much more uh, attractive to stay on as you are uh, as you're building up very attractive <laughs> internationally attractive qualifications right. uh, and uh, so I think at least that is one model um, but it's not an easy it's not an easy uh, problem to address but I think we have seen examples that this can help. Okay, so I, I'm going to take a couple of questions. There's quite a few coming in. Um, so let's start with a question. Since identity is a sovereign issue, what role do you, do you envisage for private players in support of nations achieving their digital identity goals? Yeah, no, I think that's an excellent question. And I, I, as, as I did say, I do think there's a huge role to play uh, for, for the private sector. Um, but I do think, and I, I do believe actually, uh, Joseph, that this was highlighted in the ID for Africa survey uh, that, that I did cite from, that it's not providing the proprietary technology itself. Uh, the role can be around service delivery, around implementation. There, it could be both... Um, uh, you know, managing, but also providing integration uh, integration services. Um, I do, however, stress that we do also need to pay attention to local vendor capacity building to make yeah. sure that we're not only building up international giants also in the uh, integration yeah. service delivery, but that we really do not miss that opportunity for, for local vendor capacity building. But I do yeah. think there's a huge opportunity, but you can still have governments in the driver's seat of their journeys. In a way, some would say that open source is changing the, the value chains, shif shifting the value add. In, instead of the, the core value, you're just shifting it to business logic, uh, integration uh, logic, integration services, et cetera, and et cetera. So, but then since the core is not going to be commercialized, how, how do you see the sustainability or, and the continued development of the core since it's not as free? Yeah, and and I uh, we have we have spent a lot of time pondering this in in the Digital Public Goods Alliance. And my so let me give you a set of assumptions. I am assuming that international development assistance, for instance, both from the uh, government owner community and the philanthropic community, is not going to end overnight. Um, I'm assuming that it's going to stay on for at least for some decades longer. Mm -hmm. And if you agree with my assumption on that, I do think that uh, being able to core fund digital public goods uh, that can be um, the nuclei that you're asking about, like those core softwares that, that do need to remain open, that do need to have no strings attached, so to speak. Right. I think that can be a very important role that the international development community can play and that we should play. And increasingly, this is what we're seeing hap uh, happening. So for instance, MOSIP is, is uh, co-funded by philanthropic and government donors, right? There are other examples as well. Um, so, so I think rather than forcing these uh, digital public goods to invent um, commercial models around uh, maintaining the core. I think the focus should be on the core maximizing the global public good. Mm -hmm. 
And I think we don't need more resources to do that, to be honest, because we're already, there's a lot of international development assistance going to digitalization initiatives. I think we just need to shift what we fund and to fund it more effectively and to fund it together, which we can mm -hmm. with these, the, the digital public goods. Okay, excellent. I just want to take one question and then end with one item with you. Um, might there be a danger of emphasizing technical solutions but ignoring fragmentation and other kinds of political challenges within governance systems that will not be taken into account in a more holistic way? I'm not sure uh, Amanda Hammer, Hamar asked that. Yeah, I, I think, I, I'm not sure if that is, a, uh, well, yes, it is a concern, but I don't know if that is a concern that's unique to open source, to be honest. Yeah. I think that's a concern for all digitalization uh, initiatives. They all have to be um, any kind of risk assessment, do no harm assessment, uh, et cetera, needs to be seen in relation to the context. You need to have enabling regulatory frameworks, for instance, around privacy, uh, protection issues, et cetera, inclusion. Um, all of this needs to be in place. This readiness needs to be there, regardless of whether or not the solution that is being implemented uh, comes from an open source alternative or a proprietary. Mm -hmm. I would like to add, however, that if the solution that's being implemented comes from an open source alternative, at least you can look under the hood at how that solution has been designed in the first place, which is not always the, uh, the case with the proprietary solution. So I would say that open source comes maybe out better, but there's still the need to, uh, to uh, have a deep understanding of the context. Mm -hmm. Uh, we've got we've got some few people who are joining the community voices. Actually, is it am I pronouncing correctly? Delaney Diel, is that? Please introduce yourself and, uh, and state your purpose. Yes, it is Delaney Diel. I am the executive head of a digital identity company in South Africa called uh, Secure Citizen. Okay. Really nice to meet you, um, uh, Liv, and and thank you for the very insightful information that you've given so far. In South Africa, we are, um, we are quite advanced from having digital onboarding companies, but, but digital identity is something that has been a new topic of discussion. And, and we have quite a few uh, local bodies driving this initiative, both banks and non-banks, from, so from the private sector predominantly. What in your experience has been the, the key way to bring the private and the government sectors together in a harmonious way that, that does not slow down the process, but continues to enable, because it's all for the purpose of the, 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 the individuals in the country, right? But in South Africa, there is a massive difference in terms of the low income and the high income earners and a very rich culture that, that is quite widely spread. So there's lots of barriers to entry. But although COVID-19 has been a great driver of needing digital identity and needing access to digital services, especially when we went through our lockdowns, it is something that is not easily or quickly attained. So from a private sector perspective, we are driving at, at the rate of knots to try and get it there in an interoperable way. So we're not a digital onboarding company. We, we work with digital onboarding companies to create a digital identity solution. But, but we don't wanna leave government behind and we also wanna partner with government, but we, we so what has been your experience in terms of driving the greatest amount okay. of collaboration to get that done? Thank you, thank you. Um, I, I can try to answer that, but I do want to stress that I don't work directly with governments as such. Uh, the DPGA, we work very much as a distributed alliance, meaning that we work closely with stakeholders that do work directly with governments. Uh, and we okay. also have a lot of direct contact. Um, so I have not been directly involved in an implementation myself. Um, what I do see is that um, the international, like the community, um, the UN and the World Bank, for instance, is playing an important role. And, and what I'm hearing is that, for instance, having a national champion and having like the, the, the agenda, the drive to implement such a system needs to be anchored at the highest political level. I hear that as a frequent like challenge that if you don't have that political buy-in, for instance, and that should ideally be at the prime minister or president level, uh, because 
particularly with identity systems, they cut across all sectors. They're not owned by one ministry mm. in particular. And I'm assuming that that's, that's one of the challenges you're facing. Um, so this is more reciting what I've heard as common blockers. Um, and, and as I was saying, I do think there is a very, very important role for the, for the commercial vendors to play. But I do think that um, there needs to be like the man management of that process needs to rest somehow uh, with the highest level of government if it is going to be a successful implementation. I don't actually know if that answered your question and I don't know South Africa that well, but at least I think my key, uh, what the key learning I've had is that you do need to have that political buy-in uh, at the top level. And without that, it is very difficult. Okay, thank you. That does, thank that you. does answer, thank you very much. Um, Mr. Ibrahim, could, could you please present yourself and state your purpose? Welcome. Could you unmute yourself, please? Okay. Yes. Are you with me? Yes, yes, good, please. Good day, doctor. My name, is, I'm a, my name is a Deputy Controller General Nuhu Ibrahim, calling you from Kano in Nigeria joining you from Kano in Nigeria. I what? worked with the Nigerian Immigration Service for about three and a half decades, and I'm a retired immigration officer. So I think I just want to make some comments on the issue of vendor locking with technologies, especially in the era of a data management or getting identity of travelers and uh, maybe foreigners residing in Nigeria. It's right, it's true that there is this issue of vendor locking, but there's another perspective that uh, Liv raised, that the question of uh, ensuring that you have a sound contractual ag agreement with these vendors. I think this is one of the fundamental problems that we are having in Nigeria, having a contract and then you find that you cannot, sometimes the legal practitioners, I'm sorry to say on the government side may sometimes go out of their way and enter into some agreement that you find that even the government cannot go out of this. I think this is one of the issues that the areas that have to be looked into. There are so many examples of these issues in Nigeria and uh, yeah. this is an area that we need to look at critically and ensure that we have freedom of going in and going out of any agreement with any vendor. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. Thank you. Um, Liv, I'll, I'll give you the last word. Yeah, I, I would actually love to build on that excellent point because I do think there are so many countries now that have experienced some of the same challenges. And, and I do, um, I would want to encourage us. And I, I do think that you can indeed help on this, uh, <laughs> Joseph. That is to um, help le countries learn from each other's experiences. Uh, and I do think there is one crucial world, uh, word we have to look at here and that is procurement. Um, mm -hmm. How, how do countries go about procurement? Uh, what are learnings around procuring services for open source that others could benefit from? Um, but also, uh, particularly if we, if we look at low-income countries, who are the agencies supporting and advising countries on procurement? Uh, so I do think, again, I mentioned ID for D, uh, but I do think also there are, you know, you will have UNDP, there will be different agencies, donors, international development donors, bilateral donors. And as, as a group, we need to address the issue of how we do procurements and how we support procurements, uh, regardless, I would say, of whether or not they are for open source or proprietary, to make sure that um, countries retain that digital sovereignty. And I would say that digital public goods enable that uh, to a large level. So I think I would like to end there. It's not, not a quick, quick fix, but it opens the door, I would say. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. There are a lot of uh, topics that I would have liked to cover with you, but we're running out of time. I will keep them for next time, especially the innovation aspect of things. I know you're busy. You have to be at the, at the uh, General Assembly. And um, good luck. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we hope to hear from you once again in the near future. Okay. Thank you so much for inviting me. Bye bye. Um, we now continue um, our segment uh, one, our uh, second segment with the part one, where we will welcome uh, the uh, South Africa. I just received a note saying that actually we have with us 
uh, Tine, who is Mr. Tine, who's the chief director of policy and strategic management, um, uh, who is filling in for the director general of the Department of Home Affairs, who was called in last minute when we started the show. Okay, welcome, Mr. Tine, and um, the floor is yours. No, thank you very much, Doc. What a very interesting uh, subject you've just uh, had uh, with the colleague. Just to um, respond also to what the Lynn was, uh, was, was raising around digital identity. We, we are already working on that project. We, in fact, we have we've had some few meetings with some colleagues from the bank. We're also doing a, undertaking a study on um, uh, digital identity. There's quite a lot of um, work we are doing around modernizing the, the identity system in, in South Africa. Okay. I, I would want them to go straight to my uh, presentation. Okay. I'll try to be as brief as possible so that we allow enough time for discussion. Can you see my presentation? Yes. So as you can see, we, we are working on the policy. We quite advance on the policy. At the same time, we are modernizing our system. The title of the presentation is saying securing the identity of all people who live in South Africa. You will see that we are not only focusing on citizens. Our focus is on everyone who lives in the country. I want to bore you with the details in terms of the uh, background, uh, this was the background in terms of uh, public consultation that we undertook uh, in, in, in this year. Uh, this is the roadmap towards the finalization on uh, the policy on uh, the management of uh, identity in South Africa. Just as a way of giving you background, uh, our, our, our journey starts before 1994, that is before a democratic government where you had uh, various uh, departments that were responsible for managing uh, identity in South Africa. In fact, for black people, we had a different uh, uh, system that was catering for them, for colored people, for Indian, Indians and whites, you had different systems, but uh, with the advent of democracy in 1994 then, we embarked on a process of um, integrating the, the department into one department. Now, the department that is responsible uh, for managing official identity or legal identity in South Africa is the Department of Home Affairs. So since uh, 1994, we've embarked on the process of improving and securing the population register, our population register it stores um, personal data from birth to death of all citizens, as well as uh, people who have got permanent residence status in the country and refugees. Uh, the years from 1994 to 2000, so, so the department driven by the imperative of bringing together all, 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 all of bringing, uh, sorry, everyone to, 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 to the system, basically. Uh, we've, we, 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 we think we've done very well in terms of including uh, most uh, people to the system, but there are still some um, gaps on, that exist on, on the system as there are people, including our systems, our citizens who remain either undocumented or improperly documented. By improperly documented, we are referring lies to a large extent to transgender community uh, or just broadly non-binary persons because our system is binary. It caters for males and females. So the one of the, in, of the changes that we are bringing on board is to make sure that everyone who lives in the country, irrespective of your race, irrespective of your gender, of your sex or sex orientation, you are documented accordingly. 
So as part of a major investment we've made in technology modernization, the department launched an ID smart ID card system in 2013. This card is a massive improvement from the insecure uh, in ID book. It's basically, we have a digital photo on your card and it's, it, it carries your biometrics. It can carry other cards, other information, you can carry your social security um, information on that card. You can also carry on that card in future your, your, your driver's license. So immediately you can cut off other cards by, by using our, our card as a, as a home affairs. Basically, this is just the number. This, this number has definitely changed. Uh, in April 2020, we had about 15 million 500, 500 people already on smart, smart ID cards. This has definitely changed as we speak today. As I've said, there are still some uh, gaps. As a result, the department decided on developing a new policy. We have decided to align the language with the language of international community, including the, the World Bank, for instance, how we define official identity. In terms of the scope of this uh, policy, that will then define how we manage official identity. Basically saying the official identity policy lays a policy foundation for repositioning the Department of Home Affairs as a sole provider of official identity and status services for citizens and non-citizens. In order to make sure that we safeguard the personal information of citizens and non-citizens who live in, in, in the country, the policy requires the department uh, to introduce at least the following um, intervention. We need to amend the Identification Act we need to amend the, uh, the alteration and sex description uh, and sex status acts. These are the acts that deals with identity. Some of them they are uh, seen as uh, unconstitutional as they discriminate against other, uh, other groups. Key principles that will be embedded in the new uh, legislation, they include issues around human dignity, non-discrimination, and equality. The legislation will further affirm the right to privacy for establishing a protection regime for citizens and all uh, non-citizens. Enhancement, enhance, enhancement of the population register record uh, by ensuring that no one, irrespective of their status, is left behind without a legal record of existing. Doc, I'm sure this language you, you are used to, uh, we've, we've met, uh, but at a distance where you are presenting on these issues, where we say no one should be left behind uh, without a, a legal a record of existence. The other uh, uh, focus area for the work that you are doing around uh, securing identity for everyone is around the integration of uh, Department of Home Affairs information uh, management system. We are planning to introduce a new system. We call it a national identity system. The NIS will enable a single view of a person and interface with all other government and private sector identity management system to enable e-government and e-commerce. We are already doing this, but at a very limited um, scale. For instance, banks, uh, insurances, and some government um, uh, departments are able to verify uh, with us the details of every person, especially at this stage, citizens. The NIS will enable us to, 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 to do this with everyone within the country. But modernization and integration of systems mean that the Department of Home Affairs must introduce, introduce an auto biometric uh, identity, identification system, which will enable capturing of more biometrics. Currently, the, the, 
the Home Affairs National Identity System only records two uh, infected records, uh, biometrics and biographic. It's, so it's, it's, it only record a, a photo and uh, only uh, fingerprints as, as biometrics. The AB system will enable the, the department to, to record more than that. So in, quickly in terms of um, what the policy is uh, introducing, around the, the population rate register records, which it's referring here to normally the language would be civil uh, register. That will be your birth, identity, marriage, and death, including citizenship and migration status. So we are not able to record everyone um, currently. So what we are therefore proposing is, is that every birth that takes place in the country, irrespective of the status of the parent, must be recorded on the population register. This will include capturing of biometrics uh, for, 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 for everyone. We are also saying record of all vital events, births, marriage and death for citizens and non-citizens will be recorded on the population register. Again, this is irrespective of the status of a person in the country. The second focus uh, area for our policies where we deal with the integration of our systems. I've spoken to this uh, when I was speaking to, to the background that we want to integrate all our systems to one system so that we are able to have a single view of, of, of our client. So the national identity system will be introduced. The automated biometric identification system, is, we are already uh, rolling this um, out, uh, but in a few years it will be full, fully uh, rolled out. This is basically the, the representation of what I was talking about in terms of the national identity system. As I was saying, it will enable the full integration of the DHA and other critical information systems of government. It will also enable a single view uh, and status of citizens and non-citizens in, in the country. This is basically the, 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 the representation of that. On my extreme right, this is what the national identity system will, will, will enable through biometrics you will be able to verify birth, death, and marriage, uh, all, all personal information. Obviously, in South Africa, we've got a new uh, legislation that has come into uh, operation, which is called um, protection of um, personal information. So verification will also be guided by, by that system. So, we regard home affairs as a critical enabler of e-government and e-commerce. So what, what you see there, uh, given that not all of you are from South Africa, but in the middle, that, will, that is the, your smart ID card. That is how it looks like. So it, it, it will be able to provide data, uh, uh, real-time data to all our clients. IEC, this is the Independent Electoral Commission for social grants. Um, yeah, social grant, uh, it, it will be able to provide real time data on whether the person is a, is a citizen or what is the status of the person in, in the country or whether the person is still alive or dead. Same thing with education. Uh, BMD on top, top, top left means birth, marriage, and death. That is largely your insurance companies that require to verify with the with the department in terms of the status of the person. Healthcare. So this is basically showing that in future this is what you want to to do with identity. The national identity system becomes a foundational system, identity system for all functional systems. It, all the systems around my identity, they're on the picture. They are, they are, they are functional systems uh, 
uh, that we have in, 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 in the country. The other area that we, we, we have now, this is exactly what we were talking about in terms of our identity being binary and not being accommodative to non-binary uh, persons. Basically, the intervention here without going, without giving you too much details is to say the, our smart ID card has got an identity number, which if you look at digit number seven, you will, it will either indicate whether you're a male or you're a female. So we are going to, we are trying to move towards a, a gender neutral identity number. You, you, you don't have to be identified on your identity card that you're a male or a female, but on the system, uh, the national identity system will have all the details, whether a male or female or a transgender, whatever your identity is, it will be there. The, 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 the vision is to move towards a, a, a legal identity that is not uh, dependent on your, on your gender or on your sex. The second last area is around the age, um, at which a person can be able to apply for an ID. Uh, currently, you have to be 16 years. We are proposing that you must lower the age to 10 years. This is basically to make sure that everyone in the country has got the formal identity card, which at, this, at that point, uh, we will be able to collect your, your biometrics uh, so that it becomes easier to protect your identity and also to verify you. The last area, it's the area that deals with that registration. In, in South Africa, we've got a, a situation where you have people who have passed on, but the, their records are still uh, live on our, on our system. So it's that a life uh, kind of a situation. So here again, we are trying to make it compulsory for the registration of death. And we are um, also putting stringent uh, uh, measures to say no person should be buried without a death certificate or without that death being registered with home affairs. And if that happens, we are we going further to say it should be punishable by law. Doc, I think that's where I will end with my presentation. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of questions um, that are going to, we're going to take them one by one. But just to help um, put a summary, um, you've, you've basically uh, created, um, you have a roadmap strategy with um, about four or five pillars uh, on which you are going to reform your ID systems and let's call them next generation ID system. Um, the first strategy is that you are insisting uh, on a no one left behind, total inclusion. You want to be able to include everybody. The second is that you are um, harmonizing your system so that an ecosystem can emerge, interoperable, integrated, single view, everything passes through DHA info system and supports all the, um, the um, functional systems. Then uh, you're also proposing to reform your unique ID number, unique digital ID number, so that it becomes gender neutral, but also fit for purpose for the sake of supporting e-government and digital economy. And you're also trying to lower the age of registration to this platform from 16 to 10 years old. And you're also trying to bring in the exit, um, which is the, the death uh, registration as a requirement. Um, so all of these pillars require very specific actions. Um, so we're going to ask a little bit of questions on that regard. For example, when we talk about no one left behind as a strategy of total inclusion, what is it that you are trying to put in place to achieve that objective? Are you opening up more centers? Are you training uh, other functional groups to become registrars? H how is this working? Oh, Doc, thanks for that. We, we, we're doing um, 
modern, we have more than one uh, strategy. The first one, exactly, we are, we would do that to bed registration. Now we have opened more centers, centers, health facilities, most beds now are registered in our health facilities. And the, we've put the legal requirement that every bed must be registered within 30 days. So it's, it, 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 it makes it easy for parents. By the time a parent leaves the hospital or a clinic will, will be leaving with a bed certificate. So that, that child will now be documented properly. So that's the, those are two interventions. Register within 30 days, we're increasing the, the facilities. With regard to, to, to registration of marriages, we are also now, currently it's, it's, it's home affairs officials who are appointed as marriage officers and some religious leaders. We are, we are we, with this new policy and also a policy on marriages, we want to open it up for all social groups to be able to be appointed as marriage officers so that you can register as many marriages as possible. We are also partnering with religious organizations, especially the Muslim communities where you need to uh, conduct a burial within a very few hours. So yes, those are some of the interventions. Uh, we also uh, banks as Doc, uh, you can apply for an ID uh, from, from a bank. Uh, uh, that is another way of uh, opening more platform or having. Right. But are you using social programs um, to incentivize parents or mothers to register their children? For example, is there a grant? If you bring your child and you register the birth, uh, are you able to give them social assistance? The benefit is it's in home affairs, uh, there's also a depart department of social development for you to be able to access your child grant. You must mm -hmm. have an, a form of identification. Obviously, we allow for at least three months those who do not have a, 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 a bad certificate, but after three months, you have to have your child registered. Yes, we, we do use those social uh, programs, yes. Okay. Okay, let's run through many of the questions that are coming in. There are a lot of questions for you. Uh, first question, what is the plan to deduplicate identity stored in various functional ID systems? Are you going to seed the unique ID number that is unique and deduplicated by giving it to the other uh, databases and then they can de find duplicates or how, how is this gonna work? We were using the, our, our identity. Initially, what we're proposing we wanted to go in Estonia uh, uh, direction where you have one identity, you have one number for everything. But right. at, at, at this stage, we are not there yet, but that is what uh, the bigger vision is. Okay, but you will supply them and then the functional databases will, will be able to to decide how, whether they add a number or they relate that number or there's a lookup table? In fact, in, fact, in most systems, our identity number is the foundational number that they are using to, to, to verify the person. Even okay. to play the assistance, yes. Okay, so um, the, the one question that came in, does the DHA have a timeline for revamping South Africa's identity systems? Uh, what is happening with uh, regards to data cleansing um, and the quality of information in the civil registry? I mean, you, you've outlined a vision, you did a consultation, you received 400 uh, uh, communications and inputs. Uh, what is your timeline for implementation, um, assuming the cabinet will, will, will validate? So the, the timeline is with, with this, okay, so there are two elements to this. With the, with the official identity policy project, we started in 2019, and we, it's part of what we are calling the repositioning program of the department, which runs from 2019 to 2029. We, are, we already have a modernization program that is focusing on uh, cleaning our data as well as digitizing our record. We've got very um, 
old records uh, which, which which remain manual. So we are already partnering with some um, institutions of the state to make sure that we digitize our records. Are you, that's another question that came in, are you going to allow businesses to verify the identity of an individual in country, citizen or non-citizen through the NIS? Will they be able to have uh, access to the uh, authentication services? We already have that uh, in place, even before we, we fully implement the, the national identity system. We, we institutions, they partner with us, we sign a MOUs with them, and then they are able to do online verification. And it's open to any sector or specific sectors like banking? I mean, do you have to have legislation? It's open to a, any sector, it's by application, and then a, a, an MOU is signed between the department and and, and, and that institution, the, the, the condition should be the, the, the institution that requires that information must have secure systems similarly, the level of security will have to be similar to ours so that you don't compromise data, but they will only be verifying, they won't be changing anything on the system. Okay. Another question about death registration. Will the death be registered if the person is not in the NIS? Will the manual death certificates be phased, phased out? How will unknown people be registered if they, they die? That is a very good question. We, st we, we still um, engage with that, with that question, but we are not phasing out uh, manual uh, death certificates. What we're doing at this stage is to improve the capacity of our system to capture or to record death of every person. Like people who are undocumented in the country, we issue them with the paper basis uh, death notice, which is not on our system. Mm. That is the biggest challenge that we're sitting with now. Because as long as that debt is not on our system, few years down the line, paper-based paper systems, they do not have a good uh, long, long of it. So that's where the challenge is right now. Okay. Um, actually, if anybody wants to join the community voices, we, have, uh, we are opening community voices to you. Join me and the director to, uh, to discuss. Um, let's continue with, with some of the issues and questions. Can you explain a little bit better your approach to um, sex and gender. I assume at birth, uh, uh, there is a medical uh, registration which, con which basically registers the, the, the sex. Um, so that will always be what you register at birth. But at what point in time would you allow somebody to take a different, uh, uh, select a different category for their gender that is inconsistent or different than their sex at birth. How does this work? We get a lot of practical questions about this. How should we do this? So the initial uh, thoughts around this is at the, at, at the time when birth is registered, parents will be given an op opportunity right then to choose whether they want a binary or a non-binary ID for- Even at birth, even at birth, they are given that opportunity. When, when, when you register birth, when we register birth, we will grant that opportunity. So that when the child reaches a majority age, will then decide like which sex or which gender they want to assume. That is the initial thought that we are taking through as we engaging with stakeholders. And, and so it's possible that 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 your biological sex, for example, will not be recorded. Is it possible? At this stage, what we what we we understand is that you can register your in terms of your binary on the system, but for you to choose gender that is different to your sex. There is a, a, an act that we call alteration of sex um, a, a status in the country. You, you, currently, you, that you need to 
go through the, the, the process, but uh, uh, medical process for that. But we, we're still engaging, it's in fact, even with the LGBTIQ uh, community mm -hmm. on how can we navigate uh, that? Because eventually, where we are driving is at the point where your identity should not depend on your gender yeah. or your sex. That is, that is the vision, but how to get there, there's a lot of consultation that is still happening. Okay, actually, when, what would you say, are you able to share with us any surprises that came out of the 400 consultations that you've conducted? And, and this is, by the way, was a wonderful process that you were able to engage and, and collaboratively before you ended up acting, you asked the community and the civil society to join. And I understand there were 400 um, engagements that you've had, it took a long time. Anything that you could share with us about this process and would you recommend it to, to other uh, latecomers in this game? So what I, what I can uh, share, in fact, this morning I had a meeting with, with the team as we are finalizing another very, uh, uh, I don't want to say controversial, but it, 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 it's making people to talk a lot, a, a police on marriage. I was saying to them, it's, we need someone who read, write, if there is no one who has done it, write a, a book or a thesis on challenges of crafting a policy for the minority at the time in, in an environment where the dominant culture is against the minority. So I, the, the biggest surprise that I learned is in South Africa, we speak about unity in diversity, but when you go down to issues of identity, you realize that you're, you're, you're far apart in terms of getting that unity in terms of, of, of identity. For me, that was an eye opener and it made me realize that if you are a, in a minority, you have a serious challenge for you to get your right recognize when the dominant culture is against you. Mm. Uh, I understand. So, okay. Um, I mean, will, will, you mentioned somebody will write a book. Will there be a report about some of the sort of consultations? What, or what, what they, are, are these public records or are they simply private consultations? No, no, no. We, what we will do at the end of the process, we, we are required, uh, there is a, a, a legislation in South Africa, um, promotion of um, access to public information. We will make the consultation report available so that um, stakeholders will know what were the main issues that we dealt with. Because we had inst instances where we had bilateral engagement with interest groups. We also had instances where we had um, like for instance, the minister convened a national conference with stakeholders from various groups, some of them quite opposed to, to each other, but we as government, we've got to manage uh, those different views uh, in a way that everyone is protected uh, at the end of the day. Okay, um, there's one question that came in, it says in the light of the new Puppy Act, uh, how would you ensure that there's trust in the system? I can already imagine there would be concern around the increased collection of biometrics and the security of the information. So now you're talking about more data, more sensitive data, and this data is used for more things such as e-government, other, other things. So what are you doing to practically improve security and also data protection? The, to, the NIS and ABIS, those two systems, they are geared towards ensuring that our system is as secure as possible. Number two, for every profile of a person that we have, for every profile to be amended or to be changed in future, the data subject or the owner of that personal information 
will have to be notified if there is any breach to the system or if the record is being amended. Because in the past, uh, we've had, we've, we have had situations where people's profiles were, were changed, like all of a sudden you discover that you've got another child on the system or you are married. So in future, before any record can be changed, the data subject will have to give consent to the subject. Yeah. Okay, so access to data would have to give consent. Okay, um, if we understood correctly, and, and there's four or five questions on the subject, basically you're going to go from a seven digit ID number to a 13 digit number. And the questions are, how is this transition gonna happen? Is it gonna happen when they renew? Or are you going to call up uh, the population to say, as of this date, you must have the new number, so come and, and recover it. How's the process? Do you have that in mind yet? So what we, we are finalizing our uh, communication strategy, uh, but what's gonna happen is we, for, for, for those who prefer to remain with a, a binary ID, they don't have to, 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 to update anything in terms of the identity number. So, where, so it's changes, where changes are happening is those who are now going for a non-binary or a gender neutral ID. So that's, that, that, that's, that's where like we, we will be expecting a lot of uh, uh, engagement and people coming to update their record. We will invite. Okay, but will that not complicate the digital economy? Because if you are um, able to basically have 13 or seven, the banks that on the do a transaction, don't know what to expect, seven digits or 13 digits, or will you say, if you want no, to no, join no. the economy, you need the 13? No, 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 sorry, Doc. The, the number remains 18, the, 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 the <laughs> remain 13 digits. The only change is the seven digits. Oh, the seven digits that are the gender. Yes, yeah, that's, that's the one that's the, the determine whether you're a male or a female. That's the only change that we will be making on the ID. Why, I'm, I'm a little bit confused, excuse me. Why is, okay. it seven, why is it seven digits? It must be the date of birth as well, isn't it? So, so we wanted to go as, we wanted to, so initially we wanted to go for a, a, a number that is generated by the system. But it, it became clear that if we go that route, it's too early for South Africa. Like there are many other systems that depend on your ID number, on your date of birth, like your, yes. your, your social grants, they depend on that. When it comes to your citizenship status, your voting uh, voters role depend on that. But there was an option when we went out for consultation of having a, a, a number that is, is generated by, by, by the machine. Maybe in future, that is something that would be considered, but as, as for now, there are too many uh, risks to, uh, when we, we remove the, the, the current number. Okay, so, so just to summarize, how long is the number today and how long will it be uh, when they ask for a gender neutral, uh, non-binary number? That 13 digits and they will remain 13. Okay. What will happen is when you get to, num to the seventh number, it's okay. for, for non-binary, it won't uh, denote whether you're a female or you're a male. I understand. So it's the seventh digit that is being, yes. it's not seven digits, but it's the seventh digit that, right. that will will simply be the uh, non-indicative. Okay, um, just last call for any, uh, oh, one, one question from the Congo, from uh, RDC, Republic uh, Democratic the Congo. Um, they're asking, can you explain a little bit about the connection between the civil register and with the national ID system? Um, how does the, the birth certificate or the civil uh, record feed into the national ID today? And how do you see it happening tomorrow? So at birth, when we are issued with a birth certificate, we are immediately allocated an ID number. And 
your ID number will either indicate that currently we've got, we accommodate for three um, uh, groups. It will either indicate that you are a citizen or it will either indicate that you are a permanent resident or it will either indicate that you are a refugee. So if you are a citizen already, when you citizen, citizens, permanent residents and refugees, they qualify for IDs in, in South Africa. So when you currently, when you re reach age 16, you then qualify to apply for identity, identity document. So that is the that is the, the connection between the civil registration and our identification. For minority groups or individuals who were never registered before, will they be excluded? Will they fall between the cracks? How do you avoid that? The, for minority groups, meaning those who have never been issued with a birth certificate. Right. So those who have never been issued with a birth certificate who are citizens, what we have, we've got a, a program that we call late registration of birth, mm. where we do more investigation on, on, on whether the person is really a citizen or is not a citizen. Right. If the person is not a citizen, for instance, if a person is an asylum seeker, that person then will be provide that information on, on how to apply for an asylum seeker is, is, a, is a refugee who is not yet uh, approved as, mm -hmm. uh, as a refugee in the country. You'll be directed how to apply for that. Okay, so no one is left behind, even if they are not documented at birth, you can accompany them, you can reach a point to determine through investigation what their status should be. Okay, um, we have a, a community voice. I think after that, we, we're going to move on. Uh, Mr. Ibrahim, could you please um, present yourself and state your message? Yes, I uh, thank you very much. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes, we hear you well, except the light behind you is giving us backlit. Okay, this is good. This is good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for your uh, mate for your presentation. Um, it's very uh, interesting topic, and uh, I'm really appreciate for that uh, to present it in the uh, in the African continent. Uh, my question is: How post-conflict countries such as in Somalia can build a national uh, data system on the civil uh, registration on the citizen? We know that the Somalia was collapsed in 1991 and still is struggling to build on the nation state. And the data registration is very important. So uh, I would like to how the strategic framework that can uh, uh, flow to the Somali government. Thank you very much. So what advice do you have for countries post-conflict basically? In Somalia? Yes. So Somali government. Yeah, yes, I, we, we got the question. So director, could you please? Uh, right. Could you, can you share job, any insight? Job for every country, the most important uh, entry to the population register is by ensuring that every birth is registered on your system. So uh, that would be, that will be my advice in terms of the bed registration. Two, so seeing that uh, Somali is recovering uh, from uh, the, uh, I don't know what is the right word to use, but uh, as it is recovering politically and economically, that I think that is a word I can use. Late bed registration, it, 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 it will assist uh, the government of, of Somalia. We also work with other institutions like Doc, as you're asking around social uh, security. 
uh, mm -hmm. if, you, if, you, if you have social programs, you can partner with the department that provides social security to encourage, it will encourage or even force people to come and apply for their ID. Unregistered ID. So, yeah. so basically, Pay attention to the to the national population register, which is yeah. which is essentially the civil register, taking into account as early as you can. And those who are not registered, try to get them late registration so that their birth is noted and they have a record of their legal existence. I mean, at the end of the day, once you have a record of your legal existence, mm -hmm. everything else opens up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, we have many, many other questions. Uh, you, you clearly are, are exciting uh, interest, as I expected. Um, but unfortunately, we need to move on. I would, I thank you very much for your participation. Uh, I thank the Department of Home Affairs for South, of South Africa, who had kindly uh, hosted us in 2019. Yes. Uh, had, we had wonderful, wonderful uh, annual meeting there. Uh, hopefully. We'll have you again uh, at some point in our live casts in the near future as we continue to watch closely your progress towards identity for all. Thank you again. And um, That's thank great. you. Operator, please prepare the next segment where we are going to now move to Kenya. And with us, we have two pillars in the identity authorities of Kenya, one representing the national ID and one representing um, the civil registration. Uh, Ruben is actually the ID for Africa ambassador for Kenya. And of course, Janet Musheru is the deputy ambassador of ID for Africa as well. Actually, operator, bring Janet just for a photo op as well. And then we can launch in, in the session. Thank you both for being with us. It's wonderful to see Kenya um, with us on, in this session. And uh, I just welcome you. And I guess we are going to launch um, two presentations. That does not mean that civil registration and national ID are not integrated. I assure you they are integrated. But from a, from, a, from a presentation point of view, we felt it was good to focus on national ID first and then uh, civil registration. So um, operator, um, let us start with the first part. Yeah, operator, please share the screen. So uh, thanks very much for this opportunity to present to Kenya uh, Rigo regime. My name is Ruben Kemodo. I'm the director of Secret National Registration Services. The town, uh, my colleague, Janet Mushero, the director and also secretary of the uh, civil registration systems will be making her presentation. Uh, the highlight of our presentation will be on uh, various areas. First of all, we have started with uh, the current vision and formation of identity. Kenya has had a very long history of uh, identity uh, registration uh, systems. And uh, the essence of uh, bringing the historical part of it is uh, to demonstrate uh, to my colleagues that uh, for Kenya, we use ex the pre existing data for purpose of upgrading and, uh, upgrading and uh, coming up with a new system. For example, 1915 is the time we started uh, our ID. Uh, registration system started by the colonial government and for services, heart attacks at river. And the same uh, utilization of uh, the ID that time is even relevant today. In 1947, it was open to both to all the races. And for the first time in 1978 is when uh, now we had uh, all the mandatory uh, issuance of identity cards to all Kenyans. And uh, in eight, after that time, uh, 1980 now, it was also open to females. We can see 1915, it was only for males, all the way up to 1980. Uh, 
uh, from 1978 to 1995, we have what we call a first generation identity card, which was pure manual. It had a lot of problems because uh, we had not put in uh, structures to check on uh, legal registration and um, uh, manipulation of uh, registration systems. So we used that data to ask uh, Kenyans to register from 1995 when we came up with a, a centralized uh, database. 1978, we didn't have a centralized database. It was being done in the registration centers over the, the country. So in 1995, we had a centralized database, but uh, it was a semanual because the people would go to our registration centers. We have that uh, 800 registration centers all over the country. And then uh, the, the uh, data, several data would be taken, but the biometrics would be taken manually and it would be transported to Nairobi for purpose of uh, processing of the identity card. But for anybody who had already been issued the identity card in 1978, would have to check the records and uh, make sure that they match the, the particulars of that particular time. Because let me point out that Kenya has uh, a big problem of neighbors trying to penetrate uh, our system in terms of uh, uh, be, uh, getting legal identity. Uh, in Kenya, an identity card for those above 18 is taken as a proof of uh, citizenship. So 1995, we, is a time now where we, we introduced the second generation identity card and we have been having that identity card up to now, we have 28.5 million records in that uh, system. And uh, Kenyans, 28.5 million Kenyans already have that card, which forms 95% of our population. As I said, uh, we, use, we are using first generation to clean the second generation. And now, next. And now, the, next. Yeah, next slide. Yeah, next slide, yes. Okay, the, those, those are the identity cards uh, we, we have had since uh, the colonial era. You can see the one for 1915. You can see the one for 1947, which was opened to all the races. 1963 is the time we got independent and uh, we just changed the, the coat of arms. Then uh, the, the second, the first generation, 1978. And now 1995 is uh, the, the the one which is uh, we call the second generation, which is uh, using a plastic uh, material. Now we have we have moved into a new card called the Huduma card, which is uh, the third generation of identity card. Next slide. So let me now go to our Huduma. As I said, that's the the third generation identity card uh, system which uh, is a more of an upgrade of the second generation, but an automated one using an electronic uh, system. And uh, it was established by law, both uh, through an executive order from the president. And again, uh, we have also within our Registration of Persons Act, uh, uh, incorporated the issuance and the registration of that, of that kind. A Huduma kind, it entails the fully automation system, both from uh, registration centers all the way to the processing of identity cards. Again, uh, it aims at the uh, integration of services from various organizations which uh, are population related, like uh, our revenue authority, our social security, our health security, and the driving license and the uh, immigration and civil registration. Uh, when uh, it is perfected because it is work in progress uh, in uh, the law, we reuse bo issue both the minor scans for children at the age of six and an adult for a national card. And, uh, and of course, we will also be issuing uh, the major card at 18. So far, over 10 million Huduma cards have already produced and uh, distributed throughout the country. But let me point out that. Uh, it is not a legal card yet because uh, our law is still in parliament. It has not been uh, registered. So we are using both the second generation and uh, the Huduma card uh, simultaneously. Continue. Next slide. 
So the scope of the project, like I've said, is that we're going to take national biometric registration of all citizens. And from, we have already done that. We captured that 8.9, uh, that 8.5 million records. And uh, for both the foreigners and the children uh, who are below 18, and again for the citizen, the citizenry. And then we also wish to integrate and harmonize all the existing national registration databases in Kenya. For example, we find the other organs which are uh, involved in the population around the systems. They have their own national databases. Some of them have been trying to come up with electronic databases. And the, the government has uh, found it feel that uh, for purpose of cost cutting and also for purpose of harmonization, that all of them should be integrated into one national database. And again, a reference point where we reissue the one number at uh, birth. It, it, my colleague will be talking about that later, how we are going about that. But for purpose of uh, the current uh, Huduma card or Huduma number which you're issuing, and for purpose of continuity, we are utilizing the same uh, identical card number which we hand, but of course uh, adding some prefix maybe in, in, in the card for purpose of distinguishing it from the current card. And then again, the production and issuance of Uduma number unique to each person. Next slide. So uh, first of all, let me point out that uh, an end card in Kenya is compulsory to all citizens by law. And uh, you can be prosecuted for not uh, having one or using one. Two, we are already using the identity card across our government commercial sectors and uh, all other areas. Like now, right now, we are in the process of uh, voter registration. We are going to have uh, elections next year in August. And uh, for updating of this voters register, everyone must have uh, an identity card. And uh, of course, for some of them, passports. Then again, when it will come to the day, the day of the general elections, uh, when voting, everybody must present an identity card, not a voter's card, but an identity card. We also have a new citizen platform in, in Kenya where all the data from uh, identity card system has been uh, migrated to a new citizen platform and where all other Kenyans who require certain services uh, are able to apply through the easy ten, uh, the, the, the easy ten platform. Things like uh, passports, uh, birth certificates, uh, and again, uh, like a certificate of good conduct, and as many others, you apply through that system. But let me point out uh, that uh, for Uduma, it is going to be an upgrade of the e-citizen platform using digitalized uh, and uh, better captured uh, biometrics. So we are also building on the legal system, relying on the data, like I've been pointed to say in Kenya, we have decided that uh, let's use the existing because we have a node legal regime. We have also had uh, a lot of data which is existing. So we are using that one to identify missing gaps and then building a new ecosystems. Um, again, like I pointed out, enrollment is a work in progress. We captured that 8.5 million. Our population is allowed 50 million, and we are going to carry out another registration soon for purpose of, uh, for purpose of capturing everybody into the new database. Uh, within the staff can community, uh, with, uh, we have a protocol where identity cards can be used as a travel document. Right now, uh, the authorities of uh, Uganda and Rwanda have already recognized use of uh, the identity card as a travel document. You can travel to Uganda, you can travel to Rwanda, and you can also travel to Kenya from those countries by use of uh, the identity card. Continue. Next slide. Yes, the legal regimes, like I said, uh, uh, the, in 1978, we uh, enacted the Laws of Kenya Registration Persons Act to make it compulsory for registration of everybody 18 years and above for purpose of the Huduma, so that it could have some legal mandate. We also had a miscellaneous amendment, and it was also in, in, instituted into, into, uh, into the law. 
again uh, we have uh, we have come up with a, a, a new law which is in parliament which is uh, named uh, the sorry but before i get to there i've said uh, we also we have also some regulations to support the registration for huduma by the way huduma means in kenya huduma means services because the identity card in Kenya is more for services and also again, of course, for identification and security. We also, we had a lot of uh, legal challenges that uh, we, were, we were in a process of uh, interfering with people's privacy. So in uh, 2019, we were able to enact the Data Protection Act and the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner is already in place. Again, uh, like I've said, uh, the Huduma Bill is already in Parliament. The essence of this uh, law is to integrate uh, all the agencies, especially the National Legislation Bureau and the CRIS, so that uh, you can have one entity which will be handling uh, registration of individuals from birth to death. And again, after that, uh, in Ted and to it, we will also have the we have also developed uh, uh, the regulations. When I say we. It is an interministerial format. It's uh, where it involves a lot of players who are, who are really involved and affected by the services which uh, the new uh, the new card or the new legislation is going to affect. Next slide. Okay. In terms of uh, financing. Let me start by pointing out that uh, the identical uh, system in Kenya is fully government, uh, government financed. And again, also the Huduma, pro, uh, the Um, Ruben, I think we lost your connection. Uh, Janet, are you are you still with us, or has Kenya lost the connection? I'm here. I'm, I'm with you. Okay, okay. Uh, Ruben, are you with us? No, we lost Ruben. Uh, Janet, can. Can you back back Ruben up to complete his presentation, and then kick into your presentation? I, I'm worried we can't reach him. Dr. Athnik, Ruben is back. Uh, they uh, are Ruben just back. Uh, sorting out his system right now, but Ruben okay. is back. Okay, uh, we don't hear him. Mr. Kamosa, please unmute. Yes, I'm uh, on the technical platform where I uh, started by saying we have an office, a base database uh, of capturing 10 fingerprints mm -hmm. and also facial recognition. That's going to be working in progress right now. Uh, what has been uh, validated is on uh, the fingerprints. That's what we're using both. In, 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 our, in our registration task. But of course, for purpose of capturing, we also capture facial recognition. Again, uh, we have a centralized card production, like I said, for the current ID. And also for the Huduma, we are going, we also have a centralized uh, uh, database, I'm sorry, production center, which uh, will be used to process all sorts of other documents, including the proposed that we could also process the, uh, the driving licenses from there, the passports from there, and all other documentation in one centralized and secure and environment. I'd mentioned about the Huduma number that it contains a unique person's identifier and a centralized database and a Unuma card. Uh, the Huduma number card, that is the chip 
will contain two fingerprints with the best quality verification authentication. One from each either of the hand. At the net, you'll have several data. You'll also have data of various organizations, which uh, right now are using the ID uh, for purpose of an application. You'll have the KRA, K K that's our revenue authority pin number. You'll have the NSSF number. You'll have the NHF number. And various other organs which uh, use, or agencies, which use the ID for purpose of identification. We are also piloting uh, to you with the, our National Health Insurance Fund right now on how they can use our Huduma account for purpose of services. What I try, I'm trying to say is that we already have an HIF account, but we are saying with the with the Huduma account, it will be more cost effective and practicable to use our current Huduma account to replace the National Health Insurance Account, uh, which, uh, which had been developed. Next slide. Yes, uh, those are the data protection and privacy measures we have. We have the Protection Act. We have the Data Protection Act. Uh, and I, had, I think I had already gone through that time. Yes. yes. Next slide. Yes, challenges. One of the challenges uh, when we were trying to register people for the Hudumas exercise is that there was apathy. A lot of the uh, people were very apprehensive about it. They thought it would interfere with their privacy. Others didn't think it would work. Kenyans have been used to the current identity account because in Kenya, like I said, there's nothing you can do without uh, your identity account. And of course, uh, humanly, a lot of people resist change. So we had uh, new applicants who were not very keen. Yes, a lot of us, uh, civil society and other organs have uh, taken us to court on various issues in terms of uh, the new Huduma card. And again, uh, the use case is a major issue. As I said, we started by uh, upgrading the current uh, card to have a chip and also to capture the digital data. And uh, now we are at uh, a, a level where we can start saying, yes, we now wish to get it to the next level where various organs, various individuals and can. Mr. Komota, are you with us? We seem to have lost Mr. Komota again. I think this is an important slide uh, for, for our audience to take in, into account. Um, actually, we will make the slide available. Um, given given the, the shakiness of this, can, can we uh, finish this presentation, operator, and move to Janet? She seems to have a better connection, and then we can come back. Sorry about that. Um, this is the problem with uh, connections often. Okay, so Janet, if you are ready, welcome. I Thank hope you. you have a good connection. And oh, uh, I hope I have a good connection. I'm ready. Okay, operator, please, please launch. Yes, thank you very much for having me. My name is Janet Mushero. I'm the head of civil registration services where we register births and deaths. Move on. And uh, as I said, uh, civil registration is a government agency in the Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government, which is mandated to register all births and deaths in Kenya, occurring in Kenya, and those of Kenyans occurring abroad. We operate under Cap 149, Rolls of Kenya. Let's move on. Uh, now, this is a pictorial way of uh, how we do registration. That is the registration process and how we transmit registers of birth and death. You can see the national registry that is based in Nairobi. Then we have sub-county offices. 
the sub-county offices receive notification from assistant chiefs for those children and people who, children who are born uh, at home. And then the other agent of registration is medical personnel for events of births and deaths occurring in health facilities. And then the, whoever is not registered, if a child is not registered either in a hospital or at home, we capture them uh, in what we call MCH strategy. When they are coming for immunization, we make sure that we register them that time. And that is how we've managed to ensure that our bad registration is high. Let's move on. Uh, that is just the vision of the department is a to be a comprehensive and reliable source of personal, legal records and vital statistics. And our mission is to promote and enhance the security of Kenya, creating a comprehensive population database, personal legal records and generation of timely and reliable vital statistics through registration of births and deaths. Those are our mission and vision. We, the legal framework for the department, we are anchored under the constitution of Kenya 2010. And then we have a births and death registration act, CAP 149, which we have repealed, but it's not yet through as the mother said, we are still operating under CAP 149. And then the other statutes such as data protection act 2019, Huduma number 2021, National Civil Registration and Identity Management 2021, and other small statutes. That is how we operate. And that is the status of bad registration in the country. As you can see, bad registration declined from 64.1% in 2016 to 20%, to 60.9% in 2017. But since then, it has been on an upward trend from 73.4% 73 in 2018 to 82.9% in 2020, which means we are doing very well in bad registration due to various interventions. And the proportion of uh, births registered in health facilities has, in, has increased from 95.6%. In 2019 to 97.7 in 2020, due to also interventions by the government um, availing universal health care to Kenyans and awareness creation to mothers that they should have their children in health facilities. However, there is a, great, a general decline on birth registration from community. That is, um, that means if the the births increased in hospitals, they have reduced in the communities from 4.4% in 2019 to 2.3% in 2020, which for us is a positive thing because we want all children to be born in hospitals. Move on. And, and then uh, status of death registration in the country. Uh, nationally, death registration has been on a downward trend from 41.9% in 2016 to 37% in 2020. We have been interrogating and asking ourselves why this is so, yet it's mandatory for one to get a burial permit before they bury their dead. Uh, the proportion of deaths registered in health facilities has also declined from 57.2% 57 57 in 2019 to 53.6% in 2020. Uh, there is an increase in death registration in community from 42.8% in 2019 to 46.4%. What we did uh, to interrogate and find out why this is happening, we teamed up with the WHO, CDC, and Vital Strategies to find out why death registration in hospitals is happening. And we have piloted in uh, six counties. And what is coming up is that more deaths are happening in the communities as opposed to, to hospitals. And the, the dashboard is really showing us that and uh, we want to, and when more deaths occur in community, it means most of them go unregistered. Unless the chief there is very, very active. So what we are doing, we are creating a lot of awareness 
and uh, building capacity of assistant chiefs so that they make sure that they report all dates that happen in their areas of jurisdiction. Move on. Uh, civil registration and vital statistics milestones. We digitized records in our server right now, we have 46 million records, which means that is almost the entire population of the country. And uh, that was in preparation of automation because we realized automation is key for us to, to maintain proper registration of births and deaths. And then development and rollout of a web-based application, CRVS, in eight counties, we realized that we cannot automate the entire country at a go. So what we did, we started with Nairobi and uh, seven other counties. Then we rolled out to the rest of the country. Then to do that, we realized that we have to review our business process because uh, before we were registering using manual processes. So on an automated process, we, need, we needed to to review our business process, which we've done. And also we reviewed the tools, including the papers, which people are fearing. And then in Nairobi, when you are applying for a death or a birth, you have to do it on a digital platform. You apply through e-citizen. And we have uh, come up with what we are calling a one-day service because we don't want to tire the population. So they come in the morning, and in the evening, they go back with their either a birth certificate or a death certificate. Those are the milestones we have achieved in civil registration. And that has been made possible due to collaboration with our partners and also other government departments, Ministry of Health, because they are our agent of uh, registration. We have also worked very closely with the UNICEF so that we come up with um, we build capacity of communities and show them the importance of registration. We also worked closely with the Ministry of Education who created demand for us for, for a birth certificate such that no child is allowed to join a school before they produce a birth certificate that created, created demand for us. And we also realized that we have also to work with the communities, we have to build their capacity and we have to also show them the importance of registering their births or their deaths when they occur. Move on. Uh, civil registration integration and interoperability. So we also realized uh, civil registration cannot work alone. So we, we uh, you can see a diagram there. You can, the, the purple one, the orange one, that is the database for civil registration. Between you can see a civil registrar who gets their, their notification from either the applicant and uh, assistant chief, registration as assistant who is either an assistant chief or a health facility. And then uh, we feed onto Huduma number database. And then from the Huduma database, we are able to, the other agents of registration, the other departments of government who may require our data, tap from that we do my number database, uh, especially National Registration Bureau, because they have to register a child when they reach 18 years. Immigration in case somebody requires a, a, a passport. NHIF in case they need to verify um, a person's uh, data or particulars. We work very closely with very many departments of government and they have to tap from, to tap, uh, to tap information from the Huduma number database, which we, we feed from data from civil registration, being our uh, being the primary data generators. And then you can see down there, the applicants uh, who are not registered and information need to be verified, they will still, we will still go back to that Huduma number database. Move on. So, and for us to be integrated with the other departments, we need to, all of us need to be automated and we, are, we need to work very, very closely. Uh, CRVS contribution to the implementation of the UN Regal Identity Agenda in Kenya. 
we started with the benchmarking with the best practice and uh, technology registration. We went to Estonia and other countries to see how we need to do uh, our registration for us to have 100% registration. Um, then there is rollout of the maternal and child health strategy. And that is the one I said that for those children who are not born in hospitals and not who, those who are not also registered at home, we make sure we register them during immunization because most mothers, majority of them will usually take their children for immunization, even when they were not born in hospital. So that way we've been able to register very many children, especially even in, uh, in Nairobi, we are almost of 100% registration and we are making sure that even in other counties, there the, the, the is the same case. Then we, we realized that uh, the assistant chief who do register, who are our agents of registration, we have done a lot of capacity building because we realized most of them did not have the knowledge of how to do registration. They also, there is also a very high turnover of the assistant chiefs. So we made sure that we build their capacity, even in hospitals, we realized that the medical personnel, some of them view registration as if it's not their mandate. So we really have worked with them, built their capacity and shown them the importance of uh, registering vital events. And then we've also done a lot of awareness creation and advocacy of civil registration services. We come up with a Kenya vital statistics report every year, working very closely with the United Nations uh, Operation Fund. And uh, that, a report is very useful and informative of the trends of the population in the country. We've also increased our registration offices because we realized uh, the population is getting very tired, moving from uh, one place to another. So what we've done, we are trying to increase the number of registration agents. And we want to have, in, it was passed in parliament last year. It's not yet fully funded but we are moving on and we are hoping that funding will be availed so that we have in every sub-county, we have a registration office. We also do a lot of monitoring and evaluation to see our weak areas. And we also make sure that for those people who are nomads, we follow them where we, they are. So we do mobile registration and that is how we managed to implement the UN RIA agenda. And we are hoping by 20 that you have covered the coverage you have reached 100%. Move on. And those are the strategies we employ to achieve universal registration of vital events by 2030 or earlier. We are hoping that uh, we are, that, that is uh, digitization. We are doing digitization to ensure that all civil registration operations are done and executed on a fully automated platform. Right now, as I said, Daria, it's only in Nairobi and some other eight sub-counties. The rest of the country is manual, and you know, with the manual process, is subject to abuse, subject to duplication, and that is what we are trying to avoid. Uh, we are scaling up the rollout of the maternal and child health strategy. This is the one I said where we capture, uh, we register children when they go for immunization. So it's not in all sub-counties. So we are trying to roll it so that in every sub-county, every child who visits, visits a health facility for immunization is registered. Then we are also strengthening strategic partnership and collaboration with stakeholders and development partners. We have a technical working group made up of uh, government departments in charge of uh, those who registration in one way or another. We also have development partners who support us. And uh, the technical working group backs and uh, directs and the, the activities of the department. We see where there are gaps, we come up with solution. And this also help us not to have duplication or overlap of partners supporting the same, the same activity. 
Then that is where I talked about mobile registration in hard to reach areas. Some of our areas are very fast and far. And so we do mobile registration in those communities, especially the nomads. We also go to refugee camps and ensure that they are, their children are all registered. Then we do capacity building, not just for our officers, but also for community, because we realize you can't force them unless you let them know first why you need to register them. And uh, monitoring, we've increased monitoring. And then we are also, we have also started using like what I talked about, rapid mortality surveillance. We are using mobile phones for reporting. And we've seen it's really working because all the assistant chiefs are able to report in real time of a death if it happens. And we are able to see that on the dashboard. Move on. What we've learned from COVID pandemic is that legal identity remain a crucial during emergencies and pandemics because um, we realize, uh, most people realize the importance of civil registration when this pandemic strike. Everybody was asking us for data. And I think that is when we started working with CDC and WHO because they realized they should have supported civil registration area so that we are able to report, um, re to come up with real-time data on death. Uh, a complete CRVS system is an ideal component in a population for proper and accurate data reporting. I think um, there is a conference of ministers that was started to support CRVS in, in Africa. And I think that is a, an action towards the right direction because most countries, their CRVS is neglected. And you only realize that when you have an emergency or, or, a, or a pandemic like uh, COVID-19, because you don't know how many people died, you don't know where they died, you don't know the cause of death. Uh, and I think um, we've real, uh, that we have learned that during, during COVID-19. Okay, Janet. So we also need a res resilient system. And that is what we are doing to have a system that is even during emergencies is able to, is able to produce data and show the position of the country. Let's move on. Yeah, let, let's wrap up, if we, please. Yeah, the challenges are just like what um, is bedeavoring most of the countries in a great number of uh, registration agents. Practice of re-reporting, especially in death, such that the death uh, certificate is not complete because you, a re person may not know what caused the death. Uh, then there's widespread apathy and lack of immediate tangible registration of births and death. Then there is geographical coverage challenges because the areas are vast. Move on. And then I summarize by showing our services. From when you are born, we register you. And in between you are managed. And then when you die again, we exit you through a death certificate. Thank you very much. That's a very nice uh, photo um, graphic. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, actually, there are some questions. But before we do that, I want to get clarification. The Huduma number is actually a Huduma card. You have to pay for it. Is that correct or is it free? Oh, now it's free. Ah, Huduma card is free. Is yes. Huduma card uh, accessible to refugees? Because Janet, you said you register refugees. Um, Ruben, do you register refugees? Yes, I, I register refugees on behalf of uh, the Commissioner for Refugees. I process right. identity cards for them. We also, we are also processing refugee cards for them. And also alien cards. They don't get Huduma number cards. They, they, they get Huduma number cards. Okay, so Huduma is really inclusive. It allows you, there was a question here that says, um, if yes, which, we, which you said yes, how did the government work with UNHCR, which already has a database of these individuals' identity? Were there any coordination between you and UNHCR in registering the refugees? Okay, all the data from refugee camps 
which is captured by UNHCR, is migrated to the National Registration Bureau. So I'm the custodian of that data. Okay. Uh, we work very closely with the UNHCR. Okay. You, you work very closely with the UNHCR. Janet, your data is eye-opening about uh, the trends in civil registration. I think people take it for granted. They think, you know, you make progress and yes, civil registration is on a path to reach 100%, but along the way, you see bumps in the road and things start coming down again. Civil registration is, is, a, is a, a very much an alive, dynamic thing that you have to keep feeding. Um, how much do you think political will uh, and support for civil registration impacts your ability to produce um, total coverage of civil registration. Uh, do you think this is just an inherent fluctuations due to population uh, changes in attitude, or do you think there was a funding uh, challenges or changes in government? Uh, I think it's not because of uh, the political will is there. Although we also had to do a lot of awareness creation for our political class, because even them, they did not understand or appreciate the importance of civil registration. But what we did um, to make the figures go up or to increase coverage of civil registration services, we did what we call rapid resort initi initiative, where within a month, we told everybody, every grown up who is not registered, to come and register and registration that time was free. That we did in 2019. And that made our registration go high. Oh, so there was a special event that made it go high, yes. which was date registration. But I'm yes. talking about, about new birth registration, um, the newly birth, new, newly born registration. Do you see fluctuations in that over time? Um, especially during COVID-19 when we started, because most people are fearing to go to a health facility to give birth oh, there. And also they are substantive, even when they register, those registers were not reaching us on time. So that is why there are, sometimes you can experience a fluctuation because of maybe a disaster or an emergency in a population. Right. And that is what we witnessed. But now it was declared an essential service and we cannot close down. We have to continue registering and it's compulsory. Right, okay. Ruben, um, there's a question here for you, which basically says, you, you know, the, the Huduma number or Huduma card, Huduma identity is essentially a service uh, identity. Therefore, it's, it's, a, it's supposed to support sectors that want to deliver services. Now, are these sectors able to verify the identity online or are they just using the card for offline authentication of the identity and therefore possession is enough. You don't need to do an online um, verification of identity. Yes, like uh, I started by pointing out uh, that's the second phase of uh, that uh, program. We are working closely now with all the organizations, all the agencies, so that uh, they can be able to verify the, their data straight from, from the database. But as I said, right now we also is this a, we are only going for an upgrade because we have our e-government system where individuals are, support, are able to get into the system and apply for all services direct to other databases. So we already have those systems in place. We are only going for an upgrade. Understand? May I so, add something? Please, Janet. Please. I think uh, that is why we are integrating as these departments. We integrate so that anybody who wants to verify, they will be able just to click a button and they'll be able to see the information of that person. It's open so, to the public or is it open only to ones that subs, that, that pay or, or that sign an MOU with you? I is think you, it will be open to whoever want to part, uh, whoever is authorized to verify. Authorized. Okay. If uh, it's an NHIF, National Hospital Insurance Fund, if they want to verify, I think they will be given those rights to verify. Okay, I understand. Now, let's talk a little bit about, I mean, we're running out of time. Uh, if anybody wants to join the community voices, we, we, we could accommodate, but otherwise I have a burning question, which is basically we've been witnessing um, what the development uh, of Kenya's identity ecosystem from civil register to Huduma, going through the second generation and all the innovations that you've been building together. You, you've been basically 
uh, keen on, on creating total coverage. You've been keen to allowing service delivery based on, on your identity. You're keen to let I mean, uh, elections be supported by, so all, all the right principles. Yet there's been a record number of legal cases that were brought. Um, either this is sort of a testament to how good the legal system is, which allows any citizen or any civil society to come and take a case, or there is a misconception about what you're trying to do. If I may ask um, your perspective on, on what um, led to so many cases, but also what lessons have we learned? Have we been able to build bridges um, to those who do not understand what you're trying to do? And do you think that those bridges are working? Okay, maybe my point is, and um, I think it applies to identity systems in a lot of countries and over the world, where when you introduce an identity system in a lot of countries, you are about to go to litigation, especially because of private uh, data protection uh, issues. It, it was the same when we started our first generation end card. It was also the same when the first identity card was issued in 1915. Actually, Africans protested against it and there was a, uh, a big uh, brutal force by the British to make sure that everybody was uh, registered. That's why in 1947, they decided to open it to all the races. So it has been uh, any time you come up with a new program, you are about to get that suspicion. And by the way, Kenya is uh, a little bit of very open in terms of uh, our legal system. You find uh, a lot of people were about to go to court on various issues. But, uh, uh, somehow uh, we have seen the, especially our political class has embraced it. Our commercial sector has embraced it. It's generally the civil society. And maybe let me point out uh, one of the fears, biggest fears was coming from our minority groups who they were feeling they were going to be disenfranchised. And in terms of the legal identity, Kenya is making very big strides. Last year, but one we were able to issue identity and citizenship to the Makonde, who are stateless, those are community who had migrated from Mozambique. And all of them were able to, to, to issue with identity uh, documentation. Later this year, again, the Shona community, who had also, who for the years, they've been here for more than 50 years, who have been uh, resident in Kenya. Again, the government has uh, been able to bequeath them with citizenship, but we issued them with documentation. We are having a problem of where some of our Kenyan citizens went to refugee camps for better provisions because refugee camps, you have better health facilities, you have better education, and there was a free provision of food. So a lot of Kenyans went to the refugee camps and their data was captured in our refugee database. And there, there has been a lot of clamor for us to remove them from the refugee database and issue them with the citizen documentation. And we are in the process of issuing around 15,000 of them as we speak with, uh, with that documentation. So in terms of real identity, Kenya is making very strides. And uh, I think uh, it is some of these fears from some of these communities who will now approach the, the civil society for purpose of uh, getting legal redress. I understand. Janet and, and, and Ruben also, one of the strategies that I see Kenya has adopted uh, has been really the reliance on local capacity and the development and, and, and enhancement of what you have instead of going out and tendering something completely new and starting from zero. Um, uh, to what extent, Janet, has this been the case for the civil registration? How much of what you're doing is homegrown? and how much of it are basically imported the platforms? And then Ruben, similar question for the national ID. Uh, whatever we do uh, in civil registration, we realize that there has, it has to be sustainable. And for us, to, for it to be sustainable, we have to understand and know what we want. So whenever we are coming up with something, even when we are doing automation, it's being done within the country. And then if we get support, we bring people in and tell them exactly what we want and then they support, but we don't allow them to decide for us or to read or no, because what works in Kenya, what works in other country may not work in this country. And we are very aware of that. We also realize the level of unemployment in our country. 
So all the things we do in this country, we, we do it in mind that we want to create a way uh, em employment for our youth. And like when we did digitization of uh, a lot of million records, we employed youth. We told them the, um, to come with a computer and we paid them and we were paying them per day. And the government, the government spent 600 million shillings and that money came back to the country because it's the youth that got that money. And they were very satisfied and we got very good feedback. So mostly what we are doing, even the use of mobile phones, we are saying we are also doing very well in mobile phone and PESA. And so we feel we should be able to use mobile phones to reach people for registration. So it's basically you're trying to leverage a lot of the local capacity and build yeah. even more in doing that. Um, to, to what extent, Ruben, this has also been your strategy in, in, in your uh, developments? Let me point out that, uh, like I pointed out, uh, the current uh, second generation country we introduced in 1995. It was supposed to have a life of 10 years, which means by 2005, we should have introduced a more updated uh, electronic identity card. We went into tender with the procurement process. Then some of uh, the participants went to court and it was stopped. It, since then, it has been stopped three times. And the government uh, has decided that uh, we will never implement the electronic identity card, because every that time, like I said, uh, we, our countries are a little bit open in terms of litigation. So we decided that to use our own local capacity. We are using our own government officers to develop the software and also to come up with the systems. That's what we have been using all through the Hudumak. Other than uh, the identity card the processing uh, machines, which we bought from outside, for purpose of uh, the software, we have developed it internally using our own government officers. Okay, um, just a couple of questions that, that came through. We will answer them and then we will end the session. Um, basically, one question is saying, can identity service providers approach the IPRS to help accelerate adoption of Haduma number, uh, ID verification by the private sector while the public sector engagement is ongoing? I guess they're asking for what would the role be for the private sector in the Heduma number uh, rollout? Okay, as I, as I had uh, alluded to the fact that IPR, Huduma database is going to be an upgraded IPRS. As of today, a lot of uh, private and commercial organizations are already connected to the IPRS. A lot of banks, a lot of hotel calls like Safaricom, Airtel and others are already connected to IPRS. And it's, it's open to any other agency, private or, or government. Of course, uh, with certain uh, security safeguards, you cannot access all the data. But uh, uh, yes, Huduma is also going to be open. To that. Actually, we are already talking with the financial sectors, banks and others, for purpose of them utilizing the, the Huduma system. But would you use them as registrars? Would you have a vision to allow like, like, for example, Nigeria is creating a registrar system, they certify, and then they are able to bring to you identities. Would you consider that? Yeah, now, uh, for data protection, you it's only the individual himself or with the express authority from the individual that you can be able to acquire data of a right. certain person in the database. So for purpose right. of privacy, that one, uh, we have safeguarded that way. It's only where for purpose of utilization, identification, you can allow certain uh, authorities, certain agencies. And because you must sign MOUs with them for purpose of protection of that data. I understand. Okay, Jan, did you? I want to add something and say that maybe we may not use them as registrars, but they are very important in helping us reach the population because we are using them to send SMSs even to tell them their IDs right. are ready for them to come and correct. So they are very, very supportive. And then when we want even to verify whether person used the right uh, information, we are able to use the mobile, mobile providers. They are very important in support, so, right. even as we've used them a lot as civil registration. Excellent. I, I think I am forced to end the session here. I just want to say, 
you know, we've been together. This is our 20th episode, and it is sort of the identity authorities and the identity stakeholders all throughout Africa who was who have made uh, these live casts a voice uh, for of Africa for identity matters. Um, 20 episodes, most of them two and a half hours to three hours every time. So we've been together in a long journey. I think the insights that have been coming out of these are invaluable. And I'd like to thank, um, of course, today's uh, participants for their valuable views. Um, I thank Kenya, I thank South Africa, I thank NORAD, I thank LIB for all, all the contributions that they've made, but also all of the dozens and dozens of, uh, of participants. We may be over 120, 130 people who participated in these live guests. So we're going to continue with you, um, and we hope that you will continue to, to benefit and enjoy these forums uh, of exchange, South-South exchange, and also teaching the world uh, about some of the experiences, real, real experiences on, on the ground. So thank you very much. And with that, uh, we end this 20th episode of Livecast. Thank you very thank much. You very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody.